Welcome back, everybody. Um, <clears throat> we are going to continue and finish up our discussion of demand paging a bit and then uh, move on and talk about some I.O. Uh, it's hard to believe we're already on lecture 17. Uh, but anyway, uh, welcome to C CS162. Uh, if you remember last time, we were talking about the notion of using the virtual memory system to, to build essentially a cache, uh, which we call demand paging. And we came up with this uh, effective access time, which looks very much like the average memory access time. And um, the key thing to note is this uh, simple equation here, which basically says uh, memory access time from DRAM, say 200 nanoseconds, um, page fault going to the disk, maybe eight milliseconds. And we built, uh, keeping our units constant, of course, we built ourselves an effective ad, um, access time. And what we see there is really this value of P here, that if one access out of 1,000 causes a page fault, your ac effective access time goes up to 8.2 microseconds, which is a, a factor of 40 larger than the DRAM. So <clears throat> clearly, one out of 1,000 is not a good idea. And Notice I'm talking about DRAM here with 200 nanoseconds. If we were talking about cache, it would be even faster and a bigger slowdown. And so we can do this uh, slightly differently. We can ask, well, if we want the slowdown to be less than 10%, then um, what do we have to have for a page fault rate? And we find that it can't be any larger than one page fault in 400,000. So uh, this means that we really, really, really have to be careful not to have a page fault uh, if we can at all avoid it, which led us to basically considering our replacement policy as being very important to try to keep as much uh, data that we need in the cache as possible. Now, we went through several policies last time and we talked about uh, how LRU was a pretty good policy, but uh, impossible to implement. And so we came up with this clock algorithm, if you remember. And the reason it's called the clock algorithm is because it looks like a clock. We basically take every uh, DRAM page in the system and we link them together. So typically in an operating system like Linux or whatever, that means that every physical page uh, or range of physical pages has uh, a descriptor and those descriptors are linked together. And we have a clock hand which says which page we're currently looking at. And uh, we're gonna work our way through and on every page fault, the clock algorithm says, um, what do we do? Well, we sort of take a look at the hardware use bit, which is usually in the uh, page table entry. And if it's uh, a one, it means that the page has been used recently. And if it's a zero, it means that it hasn't. And so what we're gonna do in general is uh, we're gonna advance the hand and we're gonna take a look at the use bit. And if the use bit is zero, we're gonna assume that it's an old page and therefore we uh, go ahead and reuse it. If it's a one, we know that it's been used recently. What do I mean by that? Well. The, if we see a one and can't reuse that page, we set that use bit to zero again, and then we go on to the next one. And we keep repeating until we find one where the, the use bit is zero. And the key idea here then is that if we see something that's a one, it means that the page has been used since the last time we came around the loop, okay? And so really what we said was, yes, this is not LRU, but it divides the uh, pages into kind of two categories. Uh, one that is uh, recent pages and one that are older pages, and we pick an old page. Now, is the number of pages in the clock the number of total pages? And the answer is uh, it's the total number of pages uh, in the system. Okay, now the question here about is it uh, the number of pages in the page table, the reason that question isn't quite what you thought you were asking is that every process has a page table. So there are many page tables in the system and each of them point at parts of this. So what's in this clock is all of the physical pages, not the pages in the page table, okay? Because there's many page tables. And the hardware does not set the use bit to zero, unlike what was on uh, in the chat here. What happens is the hardware only goes from zero to one when the page has been touched. The operating system sets it to zero and it sets it to zero uh, when it's decided that it's not going to recycle that page, it sets it to zero and moves the clock hand on to the next. Okay, so the operating system sets it to zero, the hardware sets it to one. Okay, are we clear, everybody? 
And the other thing we talked about last time, and you should go back and take a look, is how to emulate this bit. So the use bit and the dirty bit, which is typically tells you that uh, the page has been written, uh, both of those can be emulated in software if you're willing to take more page faults. And I talked about that last time. All right. The other thing we talked about was the second chance algorithm, which is uh, has the same goal as the clock uh, algorithm, which is to find me an old page. Notice how I said that, an old page. Right? We're looking at an old page, not the oldest page. So the second chance algorithm has the same idea. And this was uh, designed in the VAX VMS where uh, through various reasons, the uh, hardware didn't have a use bit. And so uh, this was a different algorithm than clock. And the idea here is two uh, groups of pages. The ones in green are mapped and ready to use. The ones in yellow are there and they have their contents, but they're marked as invalid in the page table. Okay, and in page tables. And so now what happens is the ones in yellow are put together in an LRU list. The ones in green are handled FIFO. And uh, what we do is the following. So these green pages are the only ones that we can actively access in hardware without doing anything. If we happen to touch a green page, we're good and we can go forward, okay? Uh, if we have um, a page fault, it would be because the page we're looking for is not in the green area. Now it might be in the yellow area, and if it's in the yellow area, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull the page uh, from the yellow area into the green area just by reassigning it what category it's in and enabling the uh, page table to allow it to be used. Otherwise, we'll pull off of the disk, okay? Now, we can make a better approximation to LRU was asked about having multiple use bits. The problem is it's not really easy for the hardware to have multiple use bits, but uh, as was also mentioned in the chat, you should take a look at the nth uh, chance clock algorithm, which gets you closest to LRU. So let's look at this one now. So um, basically what happens is uh, full speed for the green ones. We get a page fold on the yellow ones, but we don't have to pull it off of disk. And last but not least are the pages that are on disk. And so if you notice what happens here is if we have a page fault, we uh, take the top green page and we put it at the end of the LRU list. And now we have to pull the page that we're looking for um, into the green list. Now, if we're lucky enough and it's in this second chance list, we can immediately pull it out of the middle of the second chance list, assign it to the green list on the end, and uh, we're done. And we can return and start executing. And notice that the yellow, again, is being handled as an LRU list because we put things uh, new pages on one side and we pull them out of the middle. And so we know that the one on the end at the very top here is the, the oldest in the uh, yellow list, okay? And so if the page is not in the yellow list, we have to pull it off of the disk. And so we pull it off of the disk and put it at the same spot in the green. And at that point, we're gonna um, throw out the oldest page from the yellow, okay? And so this is now a, an approximation uh, that gets us an old page to uh, throw out, which is this top yellow one, and is uh, and sort of has the same purpose as the clock algorithm. And this was designed in an architecture, namely the VAX, that didn't have a use bit in hardware. All right? Okay, good? Great. So um, the other thing I kind of pointed out is the way we introduced the clock algorithm was that uh, every time you had a page fault, you'd run the clock algorithm to find a page. Well, of course, the problem with that is uh, many fold, not the least of which is that uh, it means that you can't actually start paging in off of the disk until you find a page to throw out. And so the disk we know is gonna take a really long time. So we wanna get started as soon as absolutely possible. So instead of uh, basically running the clock algorithm when we have a page fault, what we do is we just keep a free list. And the free list is some number of pages that are ready to be reused. And they're like the second chance list, okay? So they're not mapped. I should really make these yellow, I guess, but I like the red and green combination here. But it, call this a second chance list. And we have a daemon called the page out daemon, which works its way around trying to find enough free pages or enough uh, old pages to put on the free list. And at the same time, we can also have ones that happen to be dirty. We can write them out to disk so that by the time we get to the head of the free list, this page is not dirty and ready to be reused, okay? And um, it's just like the VAC second chance list, except we have a clock uh, for the active pages and a second chance list for the free list. And why do I say this? Well, if you happen to have a page fault 
that um, happens because of a page that's still in this free list, we can immediately put it back in the clock ring and reuse it. OK. So a daemon is really uh, basically a kernel thread that's always running um, is one way to look at that. So uh, the operating system starts up some number of threads that are only running in the kernel and they don't have a user half. Or it's um, something that runs uh, that started up its startup time in the operating system and it's running with root privileges and uh, it's running all the time. That's typically called a daemon as well. All right. Now, call it a background process if you like. So uh, now, on to where we were at the very end of the lecture. So we were talking about this idea of a reverse page mapping. So think about a page table is forward, basically says for every virtual address, find me a page and I can figure out if there is a mapping, what the physical page is. The problem is that occasionally, if I want to evict a physical page, we've been talking about what, when you'd want to do that, you have to figure out all of the page table entries and really page tables that hold that. And the reason this is tricky is because it's possible that for a given physical page, there might be many processes that point at it. We talked about uh, when you fork processes, you have a bunch of page tables that point at the same physical page. We've talked about shared memory, et cetera. And so uh, basically, this is a reverse mapping mechanism that goes from a physical page to all of the virtual uh, page table entries, all the page table entries that hold it. Okay, So it needs to be fast. We talked about that last time. There's several implementation op options. One is you could actually have a page table or a, a hash table, whatever, that goes from a physical page to uh, the set of page tables or processes that hold that page. Um, and you know that that's fine. You can build that in software in the operating system. It's a little expensive potentially. Linux actually does this by grouping physical pages into regions. And it deals with regions at a time. And that, uh, since there's a smaller number of entries, it makes that a little faster. Okay, But the essential idea is to bas basically go from a physical page to the set of uh, page table entries that hold that physical page. OK. Now, on to uh, what we haven't talked about. So how do we uh, actually decide which page frames are going to be allocated amongst different processes? So we have a physical amount of memory, I don't know, 16 gigabytes, okay, whatever it is. And we got a modern cloud server, it might be terabytes these days. And the question is, how do we divide that physical memory up on the different processes uh, so that, you know, I don't know, is it for fairness or what, what's the question there? Well, um, we have many policies. This is a scheduling decision. So does every process get the same fraction of memory? If I have 100 processes, you know, and I got 100 gigabytes, each gets a gigabyte. Um, but maybe different uh, processes have different fractions of memory that they need to actually run. If you happen to have a process that basically reuses the same page over and over again, uh, giving it you know, 100 gigabytes of storage is not going to be helpful, and it's wasteful. Somebody else might need that memory. Okay. Um, it may be the case that we have so many processes running that there's so much memory that's needed that we're spending all our time thrashing. And maybe we ought to actually swap the whole process out to give our machine time to run. OK, that's a, a desperation scenario. OK, well, the other thing to keep in mind is that every process needs a minimum number of pages. And the way to think of that is you've clearly got a page where the current um, instruction pointer is. You want that one in memory. <laughs> Otherwise, you won't be able to execute. And you want some number of, uh, of DRAM pages that would basically uh, be the ones that we're currently accessing. And you, you know, if you don't have that, you're not going to be able to make forward progress. OK. Um, and uh, for instance, on the IBM 370, uh, uh, you might actually need six pages to handle the single SS move instruction. So there was a question in the chat that won't, don't we just figure this out dynamically? The answer is mostly yes, except there are a minimum number based on the architecture of pages just to guarantee forward progress of one instruction to execute. Okay, And it's not about full associativity in this case. It's about making sure, because remember, we have hundreds of processes. It's about making sure that every given process has its minimum number so that when we go around to scheduling it, we actually can execute. Okay, so we could, um, when we're ready to replace a page, uh, 
we have a couple of options. So what do we mean by replacing a page? It means we have a process that's trying to run. It needs a page that's out of memory. Where do we get the memory from? Now, we can use the clock algorithm in a global sense, which is what we've kind of been talking about here, right? We have everything in the same clock uh, algorithm and the uh, same clock data structure. And the process just gets a replacement frame from the set of all frames. And um, you know whatever process loses it, loses it. OK, so that is uh, often done. That's a very common policy is basically all of the pages are in the same boat and they just get replaced using the clock algorithm. Another thing that you might imagine in which some operating systems do to be more fair, or if you have a real time operating system, maybe you do this to make sure you meet your real time goals, is that each process selects uh, from its own frames. So you, you assign physical memory to the processes. And then when a process runs out of memory and needs to page in something, it picks one of its own pages to put out. Okay, So in that scenario, you could have uh, each process has its own clock algorithm to choose which page of its own is an old one. And then we need some policy now to decide how to divide the pages up. And maybe we dynamically choose a number of pages per process. Okay, and that would be a local replacement policy um, with a, um, some policy for dividing the memory up, probably dynamically. Okay, so let's look at a couple options here. So one option is that every process uh, gets the same amount of, of memory. And so this is a fixed scheme. So for instance, you have 100 frames of, of physical memory, five processes each gets 20 frames. Another might be a proportional allocation scheme where um, the bigger process, the one that has the most virtual memory needs, gets more memory. And we could allocate this uh, with some proportionality constant, right? So um, perhaps S sub i is the size of process P sub i in total virtual pages on the disk. And so then what we do is we uh, say, well, what's S i over the sum of everything times the amount of memory I got? And so that fraction goes to that process. Can anybody think about why Although this might sound good, this might not be a good plan. OK, we have malicious programs and abuse. But let's assume for a moment that uh, this is not about maliciousness. Those, those are perfectly good uh, answers. Yes, I like, uh, I like this next point here. So basically, the size of the process is the size of the code. All right, and, what's, uh, and so in that sense, if you take the binary and you uh, link it and you look at the, the uh, size of the binary on disk, uh, and that would be this proportional allocation scheme, why, why is that probably not indicative of the number of pages that this thing actually needs to execute properly? Can anybody think of any good reasons? OK, so everybody's kind of uh, on the chat is basically getting um, the right idea. And the right idea is this. You know, when you think about it, today's uh, programming, we, we link in these huge libraries that pretty much, um, you know, they're, they have a lot of features to them, but we only use some of the features. And so the size of the code may have no reflection on the amount of code we're actually using at any given time. So you could have a really large process, which is really only using a small amount of code, and this proportional allocation scheme wouldn't do the right thing. Okay. Another thing, obviously, that you could do is a priority allocation scheme. So basically, it's proportional, but with priorities rather than size. And so um, the higher priority uh, processes get a choice of more pages to use. Okay. And so the idea might be if a process generates a page fault, PI, you select a replacement frame from all the processes with lower priority. Um, so the question in the chat, um, somebody had said, uh, oh, dynamic linking is a reason that this proportional allocation might not work. And then the question is, why does that uh, have something to do with it? And the answer is, well, when, you, uh, when your program starts running and it dynamically links a bunch of libraries, we talked about that briefly, what you're doing is you're essentially attaching to libraries that are already in memory, and now all of a sudden you've got uh, now all of a sudden you've got a much larger process because you've 
uh, linked in all of those libraries, right? And so that, that might contribute to what you were considered as your total size. And notice, by the way, that dynamic linking is not the only thing here. If we just statically link a large library, that'll increase our size as well. Okay. So maybe the problem with these schemes is these, these are kind of fixed. They're trying to do something based on static properties of the process. And maybe it'd be better to do something more adaptive, okay? So what if some application just plain needs more memory and some other application doesn't need more memory? Maybe we ought to listen to that, okay? And how would we tell? What would be a, clean, a clear sign that a process needs more memory? Anybody have an idea? Page faults, lots of page faults. What might be a clear sign that a process doesn't need as much memory as it's got? Okay, I see, I see a bunch of people saying no page faults. Now, you're never gonna get no page faults, but I would say low page faults, right? So the, the number of pages, uh, the number of page faults is small relative to some process that really needs them, which has a high page fault rate. So we could see relative to each other, that perhaps we could reallocate some of our memory and it might be a better idea there, okay? And so, so the question might be, could we reduce capacity misses? Now, if you remember the three Cs, right? Um, capacity misses are ones that happen because uh, we don't have a big enough cache or in the case of page faults, that process doesn't have access to enough memory. And so in this case, what we're gonna do is um, figure out how to dynamically assign Okay, and we could imagine that there's something like this. Okay, so we have the number of, of physical frames we give to the process on the x-axis, the number of page faults on the y, and you could Im imagine a lower and an upper bound, which is where we want to be. So not so low on the page fault rate that we're just using memory uh, in a way that's not helpful, and certainly not so high because we are going to be thrashing and, and not making progress. But maybe we want to be in this narrow range here of between lower and upper, and so as a result, if, if the number of page faults is above the upper bound, we know we, we really need more memory. And if it's below the lower bound, it means that maybe we could give up some of our memory and we wouldn't notice too much, okay? And so this, this is a, a specification for a policy to assign page, page rates, okay? Um, of course, what if we just don't plain have enough memory so that we can't get anybody below the upper bound, then what? Okay, so we don't have anybody in the lower, below the lower bound to get, take pages from to help with the upper bound. What do we do? Yeah, and then you cry, somebody said, right? Buy more, uh, buy a better system, yep. Or maybe you swap out enough pages, uh, swap out enough processes, so you basically take a running process, you put it completely on disk, thereby freeing up memory um, so that the remaining ones can run fast enough and then pull the process back in off of disk and run it, okay? Because when you're in this region of, with a high fault rate, what's happening is the overhead's so high, you're not making progress and you're doing a whole lot of swapping in and out, okay? And so the only thing your machine is doing is swapping and it's doing it really well and it's doing it really rapidly, <laughs> okay? Whereas if we, if we take several processes and put them out on disk, to sleep entirely, we free up memory, then we can get into this uh, better region where we're more efficient and we're actually gonna be running much faster uh, on the remaining processes. We can complete them and then start pulling things back in, okay? So this is a situation where swapping can make a big deal. Now, there was a question about how we set the lower and upper bound. So what's gonna happen there is really um, based on, uh, Previous ex experiments on your operating system, you can kind of figure out that things above the upper bound are really not making progress and things below the lower bound are uh, really don't need their pages. Um, the upper bound one, you can kind of figure out if you look at the overhead of swapping, uh, you can kind of figure out what's that break, break even point at which uh, you know, you're doing 50-50, you know, half swapping, half regular, Perhaps that's an upper bound or somewhere in the middle here that you don't want to exceed, okay? So here, the word frame, by the way, it, um, is uh, the same as a, as a physical page. Sorry if that's a confusing term there. Okay, so frame is a physical page. <laughs> 
All right. So thrashing is a situation where you just plain don't have enough pages. And yes, if you could somehow uh, buy more memory, you might help. But um, in fact, if you take a look here on the x-axis on this, this uh, graph, what I've got here is the number of um, threads that are simultaneously running. So you could, I got this as degree of multi-programming. -pro uh, this could be the number of processes. It could be the number of threads that are all simultaneously running. And the interesting thing about this is as you increase the number of threads, your, the fraction of CPU that you're using starts rising. So at some point, we have enough threads to keep the CPU busy. Can anybody tell me why adding more threads, even if you have only one CPU, might give you higher utilization of the CPU? Why does it even make sense that this goes up? Okay, because if you think about, so there was something here, somebody said, there you go. Somebody said, less blocking on I.O., correct. All right, so the thing is that um, it's not that there's less I.O. What's going on is, we even though we have threads that are blocked on I.O., we have other threads to run, and so we're good to go, okay? And so this is helping us overlap computation and, uh, and I.O., okay? Now, um, at some point, you hit the thrashing point where the number of threads you've got is just way too high, and you're doing nothing but overhead, and what you get is this precipitous loss of performance. Okay, so it's not just that this levels out, but that it just gets bad and everybody does poorly. And that's because you're spending all of your time going on and off of disk. And disk, of course, is extremely expensive and thereby nobody is making any progress. Okay, so thrashing is this uh, situation where a process is busy swapping pages in and out with little or no progress. Okay, so the question is, how do we detect it? What's best response to thrashing? Well, clearly we would detect it uh, by there being just a very high rate of, of uh, I.O. going on, or excuse me, of um, paging going on. In fact, you could even detect that the amount of time you spend paging versus the amount of time you spend executing, far more paging. Okay, when you're in that situation, you're clearly thrashing. And the best response in that situation is really to um, basically stop some processes, put them out on disk and let the other ones make forward progress and you'll do much better, okay? Okay. The reason that more threads lead to more paging is because they're going to have more unique memory requirements, and therefore you're going to have a lot more paging. Okay. All right. The other thing is, why does I/O help us here? The answer is, um, it's uh, if you have a single thread and it's doing bursts of I/O followed by bursts of computation, then when it's doing the I/O, it's getting zero CPU utilization. So you want to make sure you have enough threads left over so that somebody can always be computing while the rest of them are sleeping on I.O. Okay, and you might, uh, the choice on which ones to page out, that's a good policy question, all right? Maybe you pick the one that's got the most pages so the other ones can run, all right? Or you, there's several different policies you can imagine there. So let's talk a little bit about the needs of an application, okay? So the needs of an application or a process or a thread is based on its uh, memory access, okay? So if you were to take, we, we looked at this a couple of lectures ago, if you were to take a look at the, the memory address space on the, the um, y-axis here, and you look at time on the x, what you see is every vertical slice represents the set of pages or the set of virtual addresses that are actively in use, right? So we could scan across for any given point in time, little window in time, and we could look at all the addresses that are in use and that's actually our working set. So those are the pages um, that have to be in memory during that given time period in order to make for forward progress, okay? Now, um, so one of the answers to what does a process need to make forward progress is it needs to have its working set of pages in memory. And notice, by the way, let's back that up. Watch, isn't that cool? Yes. So if you were to look at any given time, uh, slice, what you'd see is the set of pages in that given time slice is different than the set of pages a little later. Okay, so if you look here is a region where the memory addresses in this region are in high use, but they're not in high use for the rest of this execution time. So only when we're in this region do we need those pages in. And so our working set's changing over time, and we want to make sure at any given time that the total working sets of all the processes that are trying to run or threads that are trying to run 
can fit into memory. And if you if the total memory you need for the running threads is bigger than will fit in your physical DRAM, then you got thrashing. Okay, so the working set's the minimum number of pages. So if you don't have enough memory, then what? Well, better to swap out processes at that point. And the policy for what to do, um, you know, there are many policies you could come up with. The bottom line is trying to free up enough memory that things can make forward progress. Okay, so here's a model of the working set, which roughly corresponds to this blue bar I showed you in this previous slide. So the blue bar says, if we take a look over a period of time window from you know delta to delta plus something, and I had to look at all of the addresses in that range, that's the working set at that given time period. Okay, and so here, the working set at time T1 is really uh, going back a delta period. What is the um, total set of pages that are in use? And I could write those in set notation, pages one, two, five, six, seven are in use. And those are the pages that need to be in memory, okay? If uh, you look at this other, time set or uh, work, uh, excuse me, you look at T2, then you see that there's a different set of pages, three and four, okay? Now, um, so the working set window is a fixed number of page references. For instance, you might be the last 10,000 instructions that defines a working set. And those are the pages that have to be in memory in order to make forward progress. Uh, and so this is actually a model. And you can imagine that if Delta is too small, it's not really encompassing what I need to run, okay? And if it's too large, it's not gonna meet up with the different um, periods in the program. So if, if Delta is too big, so that would correspond to this blue bar being too wide, then I would uh, mistakenly think that I need all of those pages as well as all of these other ones if the bar was too wide. And so it needs to be kind of narrow enough to reflect the changing patterns of the working set over time, okay? And of course, if delta is infinity, then um, you're encompassing the entire program. And this isn't really a useful model other than to say, well, here's all the addresses that the program uses, right? That doesn't have enough of a time component to be helpful, okay? So this is a good question that in the chat. Won't we give a lot of memory right as processes change their working set? So the answer is really um, that as, if you look at the clock algorithm, what happens is that dynamically adapts. Uh, so as the working set changes, what really happens is uh, the old pages aren't the active ones and I bring in new ones. If I wanna be more sophisticated about what's going on here and I see a changing working set, then um, what I'm really saying is I'm never gonna have more pages than fit in that say 10,000 instruction scheme. And if I'm really gonna build a paging scheme based on that, then as I go through, what really happens is I sort of say, oh, gee, those pages I had before, I don't need anymore, but I need these new ones. And you could let those old pages be used by some other process that's getting some new ones, okay? Um, so the page faults, uh, you know, this is kind of averaging over time. So as you move forward, the page faults aren't gonna get uh, any faster than they would otherwise just by this model. This is really trying to model what pages we need to have in core to make progress. Um, and if you were to add up all the working sets for all of the running processes, then you get an idea of how much total memory you need, how many total frames. And that gives you an idea of whether you're in a thrashing situation because D is greater than the total memory you've got, okay? So the policy sort of is if the demand is greater than M, then you suspend or swap out processes uh, until you can make forward progress. And here the word swap, uh, when I say swap out a process, that means put the whole thing out on disk and free up its physical pages so that other things can use those physical pages. Now, uh, M here is total memory. Okay, so M is what I've got available for my memory. It's about a DRAM. Now, let's talk a little bit about compulsory misses. So compulsory misses are misses that occur the first time you ever see something um, this might be the first time you ever touch a page um, or after the process is swapped out and you swap it back in, all right? This could be um, the, uh, this could be a source of compulsory misses after a phase where you've pushed the thing out. Um, so now the question here are demand uh, frames, basically page faults. Right now, um, if we're doing demand paging, what we're saying is we bring a page in as a result of a page fault. So 
um, demand paging is the same as pulling something in dynamically as soon as it's needed. Um, the, the reason for looking at the working set that we've done is one, to give us a better idea how many pages we really need, but two, it can actually lead to a slightly more intelligent paging in, okay? So um, you could say that uh, we could do something called clustering, which some operating systems do, which says on a page fault, what you do in is you bring in multiple pages around the fault, faulting page. So that's a form of, of uh, prefetching. And um, since the efficiency of disk reads increase with sequential reads, which we'll show you as soon as we get to disks, uh, it makes sense maybe to read several pages at a time rather than just the one that you page faulted on. So that's a way on a, on a demand page miss to pull in slightly more pages than we're asked for as a way of trying to optimize our page faults and our compulsory misses, okay, lower than compulsory misses. The other is actually to do a real working set tracking, which is to try to have an algorithm that figures out what the current working set is for a given process. And when you um, swap the process out and then bring it back in, maybe you just swap in the working set as a way to get started and thereby avoid the compulsory misses. Okay. Now um, let's look a little bit about what Linux does. So memory management in Linux is uh, a lot more complicated than what we've been giving, of course. But um, it is interesting to take a look at what they've settled on. So among other things, Linux is, uh, has a history that tracks some of the history of the x86 processor. And so Linux actually has at least three zones. It has the DMA zone, which is uh, memory less than the 16 megabyte uh, mark. Um, originally, these were the only places where DMA worked well on the eyes of us. I'll say more about DMA uh, in, in a couple of slides or in a few slides, but this is the direct memory access. Um, there's a normal zone, which was everything from 16 megabytes to 896 megabytes. Okay, and this is uh, all mapped up at C00 for the kernel. I'll show you that in a moment. And then there's high memory, which was everything else. Okay. Every zone has its own free list and two LRU lists, which is kind of like they each have their own clock. Okay, many different types of allocators. Okay, you've started looking in, in homework four, you've been looking at ways of making malloc and so on. Well, if you look inside the kernel, um, there's several different allocators. So there's things called slab allocators, uh, per page allocators, uh, mapped, unmapped allocators. There's a lot of interesting things there. Um, there's many different types of allocated memory. So uh, some of it's called anonymous, which is, means it's not backed by a file at all. Um, some of it's backed by a file. So once we get talking about file systems a little more, we'll, we'll uh, look at some of these uses of memory. Um, there's some priorities to the allocation. Is, is blocking allowed? So if you, rem if you uh, remember, we talked about how things like interrupts aren't allowed to go to sleep uh, because the interrupt has to be short. Okay, well, blocking that's going to sleep uh, might or might not be allowed in your memory allocator. So if you can imagine you have a, a kernel malloc, one of the things you need to tell it is if you don't have the memory I'm asking for, are you allowed to put me to sleep or not? If you're in an interrupt handler, the answer has got to be no, because if it puts you to sleep, you basically crash the machine. <laughs> On the other hand, if you're coming in from a process, maybe getting put to sleep is okay. So that's the difference between blocking or not blocking, and the allocators inside the Linux kernel have to make that distinction. Okay, so here's a couple of uh, interesting things I want to show you. So this is pre-meltdown. I'll say a little bit more about meltdown in a second. But um, back at a couple of years ago, we basically had um, a 32-bit address space looked like this. So there was three gigabytes for the user and another gigabyte for the kernel. And what this is, is the kernel would map uh, not only its kernel memory, but also every page up to 896 megabytes were also mapped up here, okay? And then the user space had up to three gigabytes of virtual memory that it was allowed to use. Now, what's interesting about this is, of course, what's in red isn't available to users. So if users try to use this, um, you get a page fault and ultimately a core dump. Uh, but as soon as you went from kernel, or excuse me, as soon as you went from a user to a kernel, like by a system call, these addresses are already mapped in the page table and they're ready to use, okay? So, you know, all of the kernel code is up there, all of the interrupt handlers, all that stuff, and uh, every page in the system is up there. All of that's available for immediate use as soon as you go into the kernel, okay? 
Um, when you get to 64-bit uh, uh, memory, which is considerably bigger, so notice that we only have 32 bits of a virtual address. Here we have 64 bits of virtual address. Uh, it has a similar layout, but um, basically 64 uh, bits give you a lot of memory, so much memory that uh, nobody has that much DRAM yet, OK? And so you not only have, don't have that much DRAM, you don't really have that much virtual memory even. And so what happens there is even though in principle you could map any virtual address to any physical address, what happens in real processors is there's actually uh, what's called the, the canonical hole in the middle, okay? And that really reflects the fact that the page table only works up to say 48 bits of vi a virtual address. And notice the, the idea here is that you'd have 47 uh, ones, you know, from all zeros to 47 ones gives you the user addresses. And then at the top of the space, uh, from all ones down to uh, 47 zeros gives you the kernel addresses. And then everything in between is basically not assignable. So any, uh, any attempt to touch that part of the virtual space would cause a page fault. OK, and so this layout it really reflects the fact that you don't even have all 64 bits worth of virtual addresses. Now, somebody kind of joked in the chat there that, yeah, we don't yet have uh, 64 bits worth of physical memory. But um, yeah, someday probably will happen. There's already people talking about 128 bit processors. I mean, those exist. So I don't know. Things keep getting larger. OK. so. Let's look a little bit more about what we had here, OK? Now, um, if you look again, what's great about this arrangement is that every page is available. Um, every page is available in the kernel and up in this space. And um, you know all of the kernel code and everything's available up in this space. And so it really makes it easy for the kernel because it can touch any page. It can touch any of its code. Um, and it can basically manage those pages easily, OK? And one of the things is uh, that, in general, those red regions are just not available to the user. There's a couple of special uh, dynamically linked shared objects that are available to the user, and those are moved around randomly. Um, every physical page has a page structure uh, in the kernel. They're linked together into the clock, and they're accessible in those red regions. Um, for 32 megabit architectures, as long as you have less than 896 meg megabytes, then every page not only was in some user's page table, uh, but it was also available in that red region up there for the kernel to, to touch. So it actually had double, uh, double mappings. Okay, And then for 64-bit uh, virtual memory architectures, pretty much all the physical memory is mapped above uh, that FFFF8 range. OK, so this 896 uh, megabyte number comes from uh, having enough space up in that red region to map 896, but leave uh, some extra space for the kernel and for a few other uh, specialized addresses. OK, so needless to say, the kernel's only got a gigabyte up there. So you can't map four gigabytes into one gigabyte. That wouldn't work. And it turns out 896 megabytes is the max you can get uh, above C0, because that's just the way Linux does it. So Meltdown happened. OK, so what was Meltdown? Meltdown, let's go back to this map. So sometime in 2017, 2018, basically uh, the computer architecture community was shocked by something called Meltdown. And what it was, was it was a way that was demonstrated for user code to read out data that happened to be mapped, but invisible uh, in the kernel. OK, so even though these page table entries were marked as kernel only, the fact that they were in the page table at all, even though they were marked as unreadable, meant that using the meltdown code, you could read data out of that. And it was actually demonstrated that you could, um, with user code, read all of the data out of the kernel which means that you know, secret keys and all that sort of stuff was all vulnerable, OK? Which, as you can imagine, was not a great thing for people, right? And so the idea here, 
is, is using speculative execution. Now, what you got to realize is modern processors take a bunch of instructions and they uh, execute them out of order at a way to make everything fast, OK? And so they run them out of order, and they even allow things to run ahead and uh, do executions that aren't allowed. And the reason that's OK is because any problems are eventually discovered, and all the results are squashed, and it just works, OK? So the, if you were really interested in this, I highly recommend you take 152. It's a lot of fun to learn about why this out of order execution works. But uh, the key thing here to, to first of all keep in mind is uh, yes, things are executed out of order and they're executed in parallel and what have you, but uh, and they're allowed to temporarily do things incorrectly. But when all is said and done, um, it's all cleaned up at the end. So the registers never reflect incorrect execution or violating of pri priorities or kernel. Uh, privileges or anything, and so nobody in the you know computer architecture community really thought that this was going to be possible. Okay, and what they didn't realize was that you could do something like this, where you set up the cache. Okay, um, you have an array at user mode. That's why it's green. It's got 256 uh, entries times 4K a piece, which is a page size, and you flush all the array out of the cache. So this all of these um, cache entries in the array are now gone. And then what you do is this following code. And I just want to give you a, a rough idea. You say, I'm going to try something. This is not quite C, but it's close. I'm going to try to read a kernel address that I'm not supposed to. OK, so it's up in that red region. And I'm going to try it. OK, and then I'm going to take the result that I read out of it. And I'm going to use that to try to read out of this array, which I have access to. OK, so I'm only going to get one byte out of the kernel. I'm going to use it to access something in the array. And then if I get an error, which of course I'm going to get an error because I'm reading kernel code, it gets caught and, no, and it's ignored. OK, and why does this do something? Well, this does something because the, the processor is, is running all of this stuff ahead in its pipeline. It goes ahead, it does the read early. It, it accesses the cache early, and then it says, oh, you weren't supposed to do that. And it squashes all the results. So the registers don't have anything in it. But I have touched the cache. And now the cache has got an entry in it, depending on what the value was I read back. So one of 256 cache lines is now in memory, in cache. And so then all I have to do is scan through and find the one that's actually cached and fast, as opposed to all the other ones that go to memory. And voila, I just read eight bits out of the kernel. OK? And this is this was shocking. OK, what this did was it took the out of order execution, which is there for performance, and it suddenly gave you the ability to read stuff out of the kernel uh, that you weren't supposed to touch. OK, questions? It takes a little getting used to it, but it's astonishing that this is possible. OK, and let me just say this again. The idea here is I try to read a byte out of the kernel, which I'm not supposed to. The processor is pi heavily pipelined, so it goes ahead and reads it anyway. I use that result to touch, which or, or try to do an, a read from cache in one of 256 values. And all of this stuff gets squashed because the processor says, oh, you, that's not something you're allowed to do. But the damage has already been done because I've already tried to read into the cache. And as a result, one out of 256 entries in the cache has a value in it. And I can figure out which one through speed by just saying, oh, that one cache entry is fast. The others are slow. OK. And as a result, you can work your way through and read out of memory. So this is bad. OK. And in particular, it's bad because all of the kernel uh, address maps that everybody had all of these years with kernel mapped stuff up in the upper portion. I just showed you that, all of that red up there, right? Okay, This type of layout had been around forever, extremely convenient, because uh, basically the page table has got everything in it, but it's only until you go into the kernel that these kernel addresses are allowed to be used. Suddenly, you couldn't do that anymore because it, uh, it opened you up to the meltdown bug. and so. Post meltdown, there's a whole bunch of patches that came in 
that um, basically involve no longer having one page table, but really having two uh, for every process, one that's used in the kernel and one that's used for the process. And that meant that you had to flush the TLB uh, on every sy system call, okay, in order to avoid the bug, except for on processors that actually had a, uh, a tag in the TLB that would tag based on which, um, which page table you're using. And only uh, versions of Linux after 4.14 uh, was able to use that PCID. So this really slowed everything down. Okay. And, okay. Um, and the fix would be better hardware that kind of gets rid of these timing side channels. And there have been fixes kind of on the way for a while and they're starting to get better. Um, so the reason the processor does what we're talking about here is really to speed everything up because you want as much pipelining as, as possible. And um, the, dis, the uh, checking of the conditions takes a lot of time, just like the access. So it starts the accesses early, okay? And it is, it's mostly fixed, okay? It's mostly fixed, but it's still a little bit uh, surprising that this was possible at all, okay? Okay, yes, you are understanding this correctly. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, but anyway, the reason I wanted to bring this up is A, it's an interesting bit of very recent history. Uh, and B, it, uh, it actually changes what memory maps are allowed now. And if you're wondering um, why things are not as clean as they used to be, it's partially due to the, mem the meltdown memory map. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears. And we're going to talk about I/O, and um, if you remember, uh, you know we've talked a lot about the computer and data paths and processors and memory. We really haven't talked about this uh, input-output issue. Yeah, Pintos is potentially vulnerable to this problem, um, but Pintos is not a commercial operating system. So, um, so uh, why is I/O even interesting? Uh, and the answer is really, uh, without I.O., a processor is just like a disembodied brain that's busy just computing stuff. And, you know, of course, we all know that all processors ought to aspire to computing the last digit of pi. But presumably, it'd be nice if we were able to get the answer out, okay? And so um, what about I.O.? Now, there is a question, is I.O. in scope? So general I.O., basically, I think I said everything up to today was potentially in scope. Um, so without I.O., computers are, are useless. And uh, the problem, though, is that there's so much I.O., right? There's thousands of different devices. There's different types of buses. So what do we do? How do we standardize the interfaces on these devices? And the thing is that devices are unreliable. Media failures and transmission errors happen. And so the moment we put I.O. in here, our, our carefully crafted virtual machine view of the world suddenly gets very messy. And we need to figure out how to standardize enough of the interfaces across all these different devices so that we can hope to program this. Okay, so how do we make them reliable? Um, you know, because there were lots of different failures. How, how do we deal with the fact that the timing is off? They're unpredictable, they're slow. How do we manage, manage them if we don't know what they'll do or when they'll do it? Okay, all of these different things. And really, um, philosophically, I like to think of this as the fact that the, the, the world, which is what IO touches, is, is really very complicated. And um, computer scientists like to think in sim simple ways and nice abstractions. And uh, when the nice abstractions collide with the real world, uh, you get problems. Okay, you get you get the the, the uh, fake news shows up, right? And so we got to figure out what to do about this. And so if you remember, we kind of said, what is I/O? Well, I/O is all of these buses, it's the networks, it's the displays, and we somehow have this nice, clean virtual memory abstraction of processes and stuff, virtual machine abstraction, excuse me, above the the red line, and you know, storage uh, we have to access. The binaries, we have to access our networks across that protection boundary. And all of the I.O. is both below that uh, kernel boundary of processing and potentially out into the real world. And hopefully, the OS is going to give us some sort of common services 
uh, in the form of I.O. that we can then access without caring so much about the exact precise details of the world. And the other thing is, of course, the, the Jeff Dean range of time scales where uh, cache replacements might be 0.5 nanoseconds all the way up to you know, the time to send a packet from California to the Netherlands and back might be you know, 150 milliseconds. Uh, there's a big range. And so whatever we do, uh, it's likely that um, we're going to need a whole, a whole range of techniques to deal with all of these different time scales. OK. Now, uh, so let's go and think about this a little bit more. Um, if you look at uh, the device rates varying over 12 orders of magnitude, here's the Sun Enterprise buses. These are all different uh, devices that are actually on those buses. The system has to be able to handle this wide range. So you don't need, uh, you don't want to have high overhead for the really high speed networks or you're going to lose packets, but you don't want to waste a lot of time waiting for that next keystroke, which is going to take a long time. Okay. So in a picture, what do we have? We have our processor, which we've been focusing on pretty exclusively. Say this is a multi-core uh, machine, which is each uh, core has registers, uh, an L1 cache and an L2 cache. Um, and then those cores share an L3 cache. Okay, and that's our processor. And then we've got to deal with the I.O. out here. And what you can see is um, the I.O. devices are supported by I.O. controllers, for instance, here. And those I.O. controllers provide some standardized facilities to talk with the outside world. And then there's various wires and so on that uh, communicate. Okay, and this, these interfaces are the things we need to figure out how to make work. Okay. And, and, you know, right, for instance, if you were going to uh, pull something off of SSD, you're going to uh, put commands into the I.O. controller, which is then going to reach out across a standardized bus, start the read off the SSD, which will pull it through DMA into DRAM, and then you can read and write as a result uh, once it's in DRAM. And so there's a, a lot of different interesting pieces here that we're going to have to figure out. Okay, so DMA writes to um, that's a good question in the chat. Does DMA write to physical addresses? Uh, I'm going to say yes for now, although there are virtual DMA protocols that can write into virtual memory as well. But usually you pin it into physical memory uh, before you start DMA. Okay, so here's another look at a modern system. So um, you've got the processor with its cache, and then you've got various bridges to PCI buses, for instance. And then maybe you have a, a, a SCSI controller that talks to a bunch of disks. Or maybe you have a graphics controller which talks to monitors, or maybe you have a, an IDE controller which talks to a, a slower disks, um, et cetera. And it's really all of these different buses are part of the I.O. subsystem as well. Okay. So what's a bus? So it's a common set of wires for communicating among hardware devices. And there are protocols that have to be uh, satisfied on these wires. So um, operations or transactions include things like reading and writing of data, um, control lines, address lines, data lines uh, have to be part of this bus. So it's typically a bunch of wires, okay? And you have many devices that might be on a bus, right? So this is a standard abstraction for how to plug and play a bunch of individual things onto a common bus that then can get to your processor, okay? And so there's protocols um, there, there's an initiator that starts the request. Um, there's an arbitrator which says it's your turn to actually talk. Um, there may be handshaking to make sure that none, no data is gone uh, before you can grab it. So the communication is only as fast as, as permissible. Um, the, there's also arbitration to make sure that two speakers don't try to speak at the same times, et cetera. Okay. Now, the closer we are to the processor, typically the wires are very short. And we can get very high speed uh, communication. The farther away from the processor, the wires are longer or you go through more gateways and the communication gets a lot slower. So we, you know, things that need to be really fast are typically close to the processor. Things that uh, maybe need to be more flexible are often further away, but slower. So why do we have a bus? Well, the buses, in principle at least, let you connect end devices over a single set of wires. So Buses uh, came up over the long history of computers as a way of allowing us the maximum flexibility to plug in many devices. 
okay? Now, of course, you end up with n squared relationships between different devices on that bus, which can get messy very quickly. <laughs> the other thing is um, that uh, several downsides to a bus. So one is that uh, you can only have one thing happening on a bus at a time, um, and that's because everybody has to listen. Okay, and that's where the arbitration part comes into play. Um, the other downside, which I'm gonna point out here before we leave the bus, is the longer the wires, the longer the capacitance, the slower the bus is because capacitance takes a long time to drive up and down. I don't know if you guys talked about that in 61C, but basically if you have a really long bus and a lot of capacitance, it means to uh, change a wire from a zero to a one, you have to charge it up and the more capacitance, the, uh, the longer that takes, okay? So buses that get too long get slow. So that kind of explains part of what I'm about to say next, which is here's an example of the PCI bus. Uh, you've probably taken a look inside of one of your computers. Um, you could plug a card in. It's got many parallel wires representing 32 bits of communication or what have you, a bunch of control wires, a bunch of clocking wires. Um, and this is a parallel bus because all of the different card slots are all connected together with a common set of wires. Okay, and so what I showed is an arrow back here each one of these slices might have another one of those connectors on it that would connect across um, you know, tens or hundreds of wires in that bus, okay? And so not only is there a lot of capacitance in this, but the bus speed gets set to the slowest device. So if you have a device on here that responds very slowly, then everybody suffers, okay? And so what happened is we went from the PC bus to for instance, PCI Express, and some of these others in which it's no longer a parallel set of wires, but rather a bunch of serial communications um, that all tie everything together and act like a bus, but is really a bunch of point to point. Okay, it's really a collection of very fast serial channels. Um, devices can use as many lanes as they need to give you the bandwidth. Um, and then slow devices don't have to share with the fast ones. And so therefore, you get the expandability of something like a bus, but the speed of a single point-to-point -point wire set of wires between each device, okay? Um, and one of the successes of some of the device abstractions in Linux, for instance, is going from PCI bus, the original parallel bus, to PCI Express really only had to be reflected at some of the very lowest device driver levels. Most of the higher le levels of the operating system never even had to know the type of device. So that's a good example of abstraction coming into play here to help deal with the messiness of the real world. So here's an example of a PCI architecture. You know, you have your CPU, you've got a very uh, short memory bus to RAM. So these are typically a bunch of uh, what are called single inline or dual inline modules and they're connected on a bus that typically is connected very sh short wires directly to the CPU, okay? And so that can be blazingly fast. And then the CPU typically has bridges to a set of PCI buses, and these are serial communications. And plugged into the PCI bus, for instance, would be a special bridge to um, the original industry standard architecture bus. So this was on the original IBM PC, was the ISA bus. What happens in a modern system is you fake it by having a fast PCI Express bus, but the ISA controller um, can talk to legacy devices like old keyboards and, and mice and so on, okay? Um, and also though, you might have bridges between different PCI buses, and now typically you have USB controllers uh, where USB is actually a different type of serial bus. Um, and uh, that has a set of, of root hubs and regular hubs, and this is a webcam keyboard, mouse, those can be plugged into USB, which is plugged into PCI, which is plugged into the CPU, okay? And then you can also have disks and so on. So this is a view of the complexity of the bus structures, uh, but all of this gets hidden behind pos uh, proper device drivers so that the higher levels of the kernel don't have to worry about some of this complexity, only the lower levels. Okay, the question is, is this parallel or serial? The answer is yes. <laughs> Okay, now, um, so basically, uh, when I say PCI, I'm talking about PCI Express is serial, PCI bus is parallel, um, depends a lot on what parts of the system we're talking about. But basically, the, 
the serial communication for PCI Express is uh, far more prevalent than the, uh, the parallel ones these days. And it's going to depend on um, your exact system. You can, you can uh, open up some of your uh, specs that talk about your computers and see kind of what the buses are inter internally, OK? Now, how does the processor talk to a device? So I wanted to start our conversation here a little bit about what it is that's inside the operating system uh, that talks to, to uh, devices. And so we already talked about the CPU might have a memory bus to regular memory, OK? And so that's a set of wires that typically the hardware knows how to deal with directly, OK? Um, on the, the memory bus or possibly directly connected to um, parts of the CPU, OK? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Might be a set of adapters, OK? And those adapters give you other buses. And I'm, we're not going to worry exactly what the buses are here. But what I wanted to show you is that typically the CPU is trying to talk to a device controller, this big thing in Magenta. And that device controller is the thing that has all of the smarts to deal with a specific device. It gets plugged into the right bus interfaces in a way that the CPU can send commands to that device controller and read things from the device controller. Okay, and um, some of that communication might be via reads and writes. I'll show you this in a moment um, of special sort that basically go across the memory bus or across a bus to the device controller and, and set registers that control its operation um, or pull data or start DMA. We'll talk about that in a moment. Also coming out of this is typically interrupts that go to the interrupt controller. Now, we already had the discussion about interrupt controllers earlier in the term. But one of the ways that the device controller typically says that it needs service or that something has been completed is over an interrupt. Uh, okay. So the CPU interacts with the controller, typically contains a set of registers that can be read and written. So what I've got here for the registers are ones that um, potentially allow you to read and write things about the device, maybe set some uh, commands. Like, for instance, if this is a display, maybe one of the things you might write to this second register is uh, about the resolution, OK? Now, the device controller, the question in the chat is, is this the same as the device driver? No, this is hardware. Device driver is running on the CPU, and the device driver knows how to talk to the device controller hardware, OK? So the device controller, this is actually hardware, OK? And so um, if you look here, um, for instance, we might have a set of registers. Uh, that have port IDs on them. I'll show you what that means in a moment. But for instance, port 20 might be this red, the first register, port uh, 21 might be the second, port 22 might be a control register, port 23 might be status. And by reading and writing those ports, I could change the resolution of the device. Um, the other thing is I can read and write addresses. Okay, And reading and writing of addresses allow me to potentially uh, write bits directly on screen. Okay. Um, so there's two different types of access that are typically talked about between the processor and the device controller. One is port mapped I.O., where the CPU uses special in and out registers that address um, ports in the controller. Okay, and that's these special register names. Um, and the other is memory mapped I.O., where just by reading and writing to certain parts of the address space, I cause things to happen on my device. And so I want to talk about port mapped I.O. and memory mapped I.O. So about port mapped I.O. is port mapped I.O. is typically only shows up on things like the x86 processor or very specialized processors uh, that have I.O. instructions. Memory mapped I.O. is much more common where you can read and write from um, special memory addresses and it just goes to the controller. OK. Now, um, region here is uh, what region of the physical address space can I read and write to that's going to cause things to happen here? I'll show you that in a second. Now, here's an example. If you were to go into devices speaker.c in Pintos, you'd actually see uh, something that turns the speaker on at a frequency and off at a frequency. And what it says here uh, is it's going to do some stuff and talk to hardware. Um, and it's the thing I wanted to point out is these out B instructions, okay, which there's a special code for that that really compiles to. Um, you see the assembly instruction inside of this uh, routine actually runs an instruction called out B. And what that out B is, is that's a, uh, an IO instruction that runs to uh, a 
that writes to, excuse me, an address port that's going to touch the speaker. Okay. And uh, there's also a corresponding NB, which is another instruction. So these are actually native instructions for the x86 processor that takes a port number and some data and accesses that IO device. And these port numbers um, typically are 16 bits, or they can be 32 bits under some circumstances. But um, they're, they're small, uh, a small address space for IO. OK? The uh, memory mapping is a little different idea. OK, for memory mapping, we have uh, this is our physical address space, where if you keep in mind, obviously, there's going to be big regions that have DRAM in them for the physical address space. But when you have a device uh, plugged into the system, you can have regions of the address space that actually talk to that device directly. So if I happen to have reads or writes to this part of the physical address space, what I'm going to do is write uh, commands into a graphics command, queue, uh, graphics command queue, which might, for instance, cause um, triangles to be drawn on the screen if I'm doing some cool three-dimensional rendering. Okay? Or if I read and write this region of memory, I might actually put dots on the screen. And then there's another region, which might be commands and status uh, results, where just by reading and writing uh, the addresses in that region, I get back status or I cause commands to happen. So um, in the, the example here might be that um, if I were to write uh, dots on the screen, I just write to display memory, and it'll just cause, I can cause characters to show up there by writing the right dots. right? Or if I write graphic descriptors, I mentioned here, this could be a set of triangles, which then I hit a command, and that will cause it to be drawn. OK, now, are these addresses hard coded? So typically, in the really old days, these addresses were hard coded. Now what happens is, depending on what bus this is on, like the PCI Express bus, these addresses are actually negotiated at boot time by uh, the boot driver. This is not in the, the regular Pintos code. This would be in the boot driver uh, with the hardware over the PCI Express bus to, to uh, decide which physical addresses go to which parts of the, of the hardware. And the reason this auto negotiation is so good is because that means if you plug a bunch of devices in, they negotiate so that there uh, are non-overlapping addresses. Uh, whereas um, once upon a time, you actually had to set jumpers and stuff on cards before you dared to plug them in so that you didn't have overlapping addresses for your different devices. OK? All right. Questions about memory mapping versus port mapping? There's a good question there. So the good question on the chat is, so is data getting written to memory and then the device controller reads it? Or does writing to these addresses just send directly to the device? It's the latter. OK, so you don't put it into DRAM and then have it go into the, uh, the controller. What happens is the act of writing doesn't go to DRAM. It goes to the actual controller. OK, now what you can do, uh, so the question here is, why wouldn't they use virtual addressing to solve the negotiating? The problem is, you need an actual physical address on the bus, and then you can virtually map to it. So if your physical addresses overlap, then you got a problem. Um, think of this like uh, we've been talking about DRAM is our physical DRAM space. If we had different DRAM uh, cells that map to the same physical address, all chaos would happen, right? So we got to make sure that um, the physical addresses that are dealt with in the cards are all unique for, from each other. And once we've got that, then you can map virtual memory uh, parts of the virtual address space to these physical things. And then you, know, you can give command of a device to a user level process, for instance, just by setting up its page tables the right way to point at those physical addresses. But you need to make sure that the physical addresses don't overlap first. OK. Now, there's a good question of uh, what is faster? port mapping or, or memory mapping? So the answer is uh, the memory mapped options are usually a lot faster um, under most circumstances. This, uh, this mechanism of using ports is uh, kind of a legacy mechanism. You often use it only to access uh, old devices, old school devices, or ones that are 
part of the IBM PC spec, okay? Um, and the answer is, the reason is really that uh, mapping through memory is so much more flexible. It's a, it's a path that's been set up for large addresses and uh, you can actually tell the cache to ignore certain addresses. So if you look carefully at the page table entries, uh, I don't have it up today, but look at it from last time, you'll see there's a couple of bits in a page table mapping that talk about not putting the data in the cache. And you want that because you wanna make sure that all writes go straight through to the hardware and that when you read, you don't want it to be cached so that you accidentally get old data. You want your read to always go directly from the hardware into the processor, okay? Good, any other questions? So there might be overlapping. So the question is, why was I saying there might be overlapping physical addresses? Imagine simply put two of these display controllers into the same machine, okay? If we hard coded where, which physical addresses uh, were for that card, we now have an overlap, okay? And so that overlap needs to be removed and that's part of the negotiation process for modern buses like PCI Express and so on. Now, the question about ports is ports are actually a completely separate physical address space from uh, the regular physical address space. And so the ports uh, go via a separate, um, a separate path, if you will. The data is all the same, but the, the addressing bits say something different. They say this is not part of normal addresses. This is part of the port, port map space. All right. Good. Now... And you can protect this with address translation. And where do these usually get mapped in virtual memory? It depends, the, it depends on how they're being used. So if you're not giving the user the ability to touch a device, which you have to be very careful about doing that, then it's gonna be mapped into uh, a part of the physical address space that doesn't have DRAM in it. And if you take a look at um, you know, the typical Linux memory maps, there's gonna be some spots often in very low memory for IO. And also in high memory is another possibility too, but um, the uh, you know it, it really it's going to depend a lot on the actual hardware that you've got and you know where is there DRAM, where is there not? You need this to be in the places where there's no DRAM. Okay, and each of the buses like PCI Express and all the others they all have their own spaces that they map into as well. Okay. So I think the right answer to that question is really, um, you don't really need to worry about exactly where in physical space it is, just that it gets mapped in physical space and that at boot time, we make sure it doesn't overlap with anything else mapped in that same space. Okay. So there's more than just the CPU. I wanted to say a little bit about this. Uh, so this is, uh, for instance, Sky Lake. I've talked a little about Sky Lake, but it's got multiple cores. You can have like 50, some cores in there, okay, 52. Uh, and there's typically a bus that might be a ring, it might be a mesh, okay, there are a lot of different options. Uh, each core has a processor in it, okay, the processor might do out of order execution, remember Meltdown, we just talked about that. Um, it might have a bunch of uh, special operations to deal with security and so on. Um, but that's just the processor. If you look at everything else here, we've got the system agent, so that basically talks to uh, various uh, DRAM controllers. There can all, that's the IMC. It can also talk to other chips to give you cache coherence, okay? And then also um, there's a GPU in this particular, uh, down here, the processor graphics, which can actually draw on the screen and so on um, if you don't have a special GPU in your system. And so there's a lot of different pieces in here that are more than just the processor. That's kind of my point. The processors are very interesting, but all of this stuff with the system agent gives you DRAM, gives you display controllers, processor graphics gives you graphics. Um, and then there's integrated IO on most modern chips from Intel, okay? Um, and so that's the memory controller. PCI Express for graphics cards. So you see, um, coming out off the display here, typically there's very fast PCI Express options up, up top here for other graphics. There's also built-in graphics, which is uh, lower performance, but PCI Express um, directly on the same chip. 
Okay, and so, you know, like in the old days, he had the processor, he had other stuff, then he had some buses and so on. Here, the PCI Express control signals are actually coming directly out of the chip. And there's this uh, direct media interface for the platform controller hub you see up at the top. This typically connects to a lot of other I.O. Okay, so here is an example where we have the processor. And notice this is another view. We've got PCI Express. We've got DRAM. That's the DDR. We've got embedded displays and so on. Um, and then the, the uh, uh, platform controller hub down here handles pretty much everything else that's interesting. OK. All right. So um, the thing to, to really learn about this particular slide is to understand the fact that um, the I.O. is tightly integrated and that there's a lot of really interesting I.O. coming off of this. OK. So the platform controller hub is this chip, um, lots of I.O. OK, USB, Ethernet, Thunderbolt 3, BIOS. OK, this LPC interface is for legacy things like keyboards and, and mice and so on. OK, you don't need to know all of these details, but this is trying to give you a flavor for some of the interesting things we have to control. OK. Um, so we're going to um, we're going to finish up here pretty soon, but I wanted to cover a couple more things before we're totally totally done. So um, when you start talking about I.O., and we're going to go into this much more detail in a couple of days, um, you start talking about things like, well, do I typically read a byte at a time or do I read a block at a time? So some devices like keyboards, et cetera, mice give you one byte at a time. Um, OK, things like disks give you a block. It might be 4K bytes. It might be 16K bytes at a time. Networks, et cetera, tend to give you big chunks. Um, we might also wonder, not just byte versus block, but are we reading something sequentially or are we randomly going places? So some devices, you know, tape is an obvious case where you have to do sequential, right? Um, the uh, others can give you random access, like disks or CDs, OK? And in those cases, there's some overhead to starting the transfer, but then you can pull the data out in large chunks often once you've gotten to that random spot. Some devices have to be monitored continuously in case they go away and come back. Some generate interrupts when they need service. Okay. Transfer mechanisms like programmed I.O. and DMA, we're going to talk more about that next time. Okay. These are different ways in which to get the data in and out of the device. I showed you the topology earlier with the CPU talking to the controller. But now we've got, how do, uh, how do we actually get the data in and out? Do we do it one byte at a time in a loop? Or do we ask for uh, big chunks of data to go out automatically? That's going to be something we talk about. OK? And so really, um, I think I'm, I think I'm going to save this discussion for next time. So in conclusion, we've talked about lots of different I.O. device types today. There are many different speeds. Many different access patterns, okay, block devices, character devices, network devices, different access timings like blocking, non blocking, uh, asynchronous. We'll talk more about that next time. We talked about IO controllers, that's the hardware that controls the device. We talked about processor accesses through IO instructions or load stores, the special memory. Um, as you know, there are various notification mechanisms like interrupts and polling. We'll talk a lot more about uh, polling next time, but you're very familiar with interrupts. OK? And all of this is tied together with device drivers that interface to I.O. devices. So the device drivers talk to the controllers, and the device drivers know all the idiosyncrasies of the controllers and how to make them work. And then the device drivers, as we've discussed in the past, provide a really clean interface up. OK? They provide a clean, read-write, open interface. Um, they're going to allow you to manipulate devices through programmed I.O. or DMA or interrupts. There's going to be three types of devices. We'll talk about block devices, character devices, and network devices. And so I think I'm going to let you go. Um, I hope to see you in a couple of days. We're going to have some uh, interesting stuff about uh, devices to be talking about um, next time. But uh, hope you have a good rest of your Monday. And I uh, hope there weren't too many of you that uh, had the threat of power outages. I know that there are parts of uh, parts of Orinda, Lafayette, Moraga on the other side of the hills that are all have their power out. But all right, um, other people are oh evacuated. That's even worse. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope that uh, you get back to your uh, living situation soon. Um, have a great uh, have a great evening, and we will talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>
i mean, excuse me, talk to you on wednesday.